You're listening to Soap Sound Radio. We bring you streaming and live broadcasting from the capital. This is the Arapa Podcast. Welcome, one and all, to the El Arpa Podcast. Joining me in the studio is Maria. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. On the sofa, but not in a Harvey Weinstein context. This is a clean, family-orientated Christian podcast. So, how have you been since the last one? Very well. Yeah, we've done a lot. I think we've been to the park, the arcade, the park again. Mm-hmm. And we've also been making pancakes. <laughs> We're trying anyway. Exactly for Shrove Monday, which is what we uh, comes around every six months, right? Yeah. Before Christmas and after Christmas, before Easter, after Easter, for all your and Halloween. and Halloween, yeah. So we are going to keep this cheap and cheerful, short and snappy uh, for this today's podcast. We're going to be talking about the words of poetry and a story competition that little Maria has has entered with her with her three hundred and ten words mm, yeah. of pure goldenly goodness. So join us for the obligatory, mandatory, and the sure thing that is part two. to Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea and there they take a bus for three days and then they hike over a mountain and they can take a canoe and they get to this little bay with 300 people. The stuff of Indiana Jones but rather than seeking out a treasure hidden in the jungle the aim of this journey is to collect voices. This is the intro to a BBC article titled uh, The People Saving Lost Words uh, looking at the Endangered Poetry Project which has been launched very recently aiming to gather up vanishing voices and uh, basically the journalist uh, Fiona MacDonald who's writing for the BBC takes a look at the people behind this project and who are working very hard to uh, keep dying languages um, very much alive, no? And also not just alive, but actually keep them active, uh, write poetry in, in them and use it as a tool to uh, shift perspectives, almost as an act of resistance as well and um, all these glorious things. So we have been looking at this together. Basically, uh, some of the poems are... Well, I'll read one poem, uh, which is Choking Smoke by uh, Nineb Lamassu, which has been translated from Assyrian. Uh, My country is an in-breath, whose out-breath is a sigh. Okay, so that does seem interesting in English. Because some of the poems don't work in English, or it's hard to get your head around them as a poetic work. Uh, there's another one translated from my Gaelic, which is another heat wave by Garod MacLachlan. Uh, suddenly a cloud descended across a black mountain. There were two swallows and a gull, sketching and scribbling in the grey sky. Um, which, okay, we'll, take, we'll start as, this, as, our, as our base. It's actually a nice poem, no? I mean, it's actually a really interesting image of how these kind of like animals which are black against the morning sky or the, the, the horizon are moving like a an artist's hands feverishly across the, the canvas of the sky, you know? And uh, I think it's really interesting because very often I think it's it's a stock phrase or a, an idea, a go-to idea, well, this is God's creation and is already done, but to, to, be, actual, to be actually a witness to it uh, opens up so many different doors of possibility and perspective, which I find very stimulating. Uh, for example, you, can, you know, if you're a writer or if you're... A creative person, I mean, this could mean there's so many applications, you know, drinking absinthe in Paris Montmartre, smoking dope as a beat poet, you know, taking cocaine or drinking heavily like uh, 
uh, like some American writers of, of a certain vintage, you know, uh, to open up the doors of perception or Russell Brand on, on a wet Monday morning, you know, he's just thinking about these things, uh, <laughs> wrapping his head around the big ideas. But just to be present when, when something is being created, um, I think is, uh, it's been, try it's cap been, has been captured in world poetry and literature in so many different ways. Uh, but never quite like this, I think. I think it's very interesting because nature has always been the source of inspiration and poets often write about how they can't write. If they're talking about the process, it's always in the, in the, in the, when they can't write, when they're talking about writer's block. But it seems to be talking about inspiration as it's happening and and quite directly referencing nature's pull on, on inspiration as well. So I think it's a, kind of a, a nifty, cool poem um, in what it's five lines as well so what well, is this an extract from a much larger yeah. piece i think so uh, i don't know does this say anything to you well <laughs> after you explain it the way you explain it it's so much more i know it just came to me as well all, yeah well all that bollocks huh? yeah it's natural um <laughs> and uh, this is nice as well this is uh beyond by beyond by joy harjo i'm probably not saying that properly uh beyond the blue horizon where our ancestors appear bearing gifts Wrapped in blankets, woven with sun and strands of scarlet thyme. So, uh, what you are a translator? Uh, just check out our last podcast a video <laughs> for that as well. Uh, obviously you haven't seen the original, and you're not familiar with the original language. But, but, well, as a reader, does it sing to you in some way? Yes, I I think it's it's quite nice that the, uh, you know, the culture comes through. Is this? It's talking about ancestors that. You know, normally don't feature so much, maybe in like Western uh, languages, but um, but they do more so in well, for example, in African mm. well, uh, the, culture and Native American, which is where this poem comes oh, from. Native American, yeah. Uh, well, like with sun and strands of scarlet time, it's just a nice way of uh, of describing. It's a it's a line that really works, yeah. and uh, I don't know, maybe this was. Uh, you know, this reminds me of Homer as well, the rosy fingered dawn. So like this, this <laughs> these very nice ways of of evoking yeah. red and and how it can be used to describe um kind of time and light and and different concepts like this. Uh, so she comes from the well, uh, yeah, is a woman, yeah, from the Creek Nation, and uh, um, yeah. So it's interesting because she says that she's not yet a poet in her tribal language, so. Uh, but it's something that she's desperately, I imagine, trying to get into, yeah, you know. Yeah, trying to. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she says, "I'm so I'm aware of so much that I don't know, but am in wonder at the glimpses of deeper cultural knowledge." So this is kind of interesting because I, obviously, different cultures uh, have different culture, <laughs> but um, I guess we're all drinking from the well of a common humanity, which sounds very hairy, airy fairy, but we all have these creation myths and we all have this, I guess, very shared uh, understanding of where we come from, no? Um, mm. Maybe the stories are worded differently or have different protagonists, but it kind of all boils down to the, to the same. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think, yeah, what you're saying is true, but, but also the specific details of, you know, when you look at... Um, I don't know. It's just it's just a change in perspective. Like for example, when it's talking about the ancestors, and then when we think of like people that have left, like we always like look up and and imagine like they're in in heaven is like the equivalent to the sky. Yeah. But then she's she's talking about sort of like basically them coming yeah. forward from the horizon, um, which is well, I don't know. It it's kind of like a different. She says herself that she. Um, she leaves like an English state of mind and and and, and goes to this other language. Um, yeah. So so obviously language conditions how you think of things and how you see things. But not well. It's not not with poetry either. Uh, not just with that. I mean, um, because there's an interesting documentary about a polyglot, this kid who can speak like an insane number of languages. And he says, "Well, I'm more brusque and direct in German. I'm more deferential." In, in French and mm. and uh, you know depending on what he's speaking he's he, he engaging a different ship of his mind there's another one here uh, The Kingdom of Gravity by Nick uh, Makoa uh, translated from Luganda you are a hawk silent in the voice of a midnight universe uh, so this is one that kind of appealed a little bit less to me but it's still interesting um, this is um, Ugandan language I believe and uh, uh 
I think it is, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is, it is Ugandan, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so he, they mentioned here, he, it's a language he lost when he was forced to flee Idi Amin's dictatorship as a boy. Uh, and for and for others, they mentioned in the article, the disappearance of a language can, can itself be a political act. Uh, which is true because, uh, well, obviously Irish uh, was forced out of us at the end of a of a gun, which sounds very Germanic, but is what happened. And also people I know from Brittany as well, Charles de Gaulle, uh, banned uh, the Breton language because he wanted a common French uh, identity, which, uh, you know, in the light of what's happening in current political situations with Catalonia, even Lombardy, I've, I've, uh, I've heard as well, in Italy, uh, have long-standing independence uh, kind of aims, you know, so uh, you can understand how these things can happen from a centralist point of view, how they want to maintain this kind of common um uh, identity, or, or which is also reflected in the language, but it is inherently a very violent act, no? Yes. To, to destroy a language. Yeah, well, yeah. I think some of these languages are have been, well, lost, yeah, obviously, like, uh, replaced by by major languages and... Well, yeah, even Franco banning Catalan, no, and Basque and... Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, no, because I mentioned here as well that it's... You know, um, what do they say here? Yeah, so, like, speaking a language can be considered a form of resistance, uh, which I think mm-hmm. uh, is always true. Yeah, you, 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 true. Speaking of France, go to the French suburbs, you know, why are the immigrants speaking? They're speaking a special form of, of French, this kind of back slang, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and even, you know, if it's intentional, or maybe it's not just, like, if you're a lower class or a kind of immigrant class, or if you're... Um, I don't know. You have a there's an elite that's that's definitely in charge. You know the the way you're speaking, for different reasons will 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 I think be markedly different from from how posh people speak because they want to be like another posh elite in another country or because uh, they all go to the same educational institutions. You know, so your language is a great marker uh, for different things. Um, yeah, so it's quite an in-depth article, and I mentioned at the end of it, uh, for example. Um, so the Endangered Poetry Project was launched on National Poetry Day by South Bank Centre's National Poetry Library. And um, yeah, so they're, they're just really trying to bring alive poetry in uh, lost languages. They mentioned there's like 7,000 languages in the world that are losing at such a fast rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, like in 85 years, we could have lost 3,500 of them. And uh, well, they mentioned, like, well, we'll get to an end degree, and this is where you can truly shine as well. They say, like, words like angst and zeitgeist uh, are difficult to translate into other languages. Um, have you found that these types of words are other Well, obviously, other words are untranslatable, maybe, you know? The word angst, I'm just, I'm quite surprised that yeah. the word angst is there. Yeah, me too. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine that being uh, a difficult one to. That's yeah, th- yeah. It's very similar in Spanish, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course it is. Yeah. And the zeitgeist. Uh, I think. Well, it's probably a, a word that people would use as zeitgeist, no matter the language. If you're speaking German, you probably would say zeitgeist, or if you're speaking Italian, you know, or Spanish, el zeitgeist. I don't know. What you say. <laughs> I don't it's, know. it's one of those things that is as a concept just kind of transcends uh, most languages. Yeah. Um, and they mention a lot about things here. Um, yeah. So, for example. Yeah, when you, you have a different perspective when you, you speak a different language. And there's one in the Assyrian language, which is not an official Iranian one. The poet was talking about how blue has a different color for him, has a different yes. meaning. So what you have more knowledge of, of these uh, cultures from the East. Uh, <laughs> so what was he talking about when he when he was mentioning this? Oh, he was just saying that uh, blue, he, he never identified blue with like being sad or... Uh, you know, depression or anything negative. He for him like blue was very positive because it was to do with the sky and the sea and so it was all good things. So he found it quite surprising when when blue was being used as a synonym of sadness. It is weird because it is scientifically proven that like the sea it has a calming effect on you. Um so something that is intrinsically human across all cultures I imagine uh, but when it's expressed linguistically, um, mm. you know, it's taken on a different meaning. Mm. Uh, but yet, do you know where it comes from in English? Uh, I think it's from uh, Eeyore, the donkey from Winnie the Pooh, because he was blue. Eeyore, uh, was he blue or purple? Yeah, so like, exactly, he didn't know. Mm. That's what fucking depressed him. And um, 
true fact, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Fake news. Uh, so, but it, what was also weird is like from like Muslim culture, Islamic culture, green, for example, is considered a lucky color. Mm -hmm. But that is also true in Western civilization because you have green bays on uh, pool tables and in casinos you have uh, green everywhere as well. So like green is like is a lucky color uh, in uh, our culture as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, well, of course, the, the shamrock, the treble, yeah, for example. And um, I don't know, is there anything else that strikes you from this? Well, oh, well, actually, they mentioned as well, okay, about the, how uh, you can trace kind of the inspiration of different uh, languages. You know, one language, I think, from the Alps is focused very heavily on mountains, while Gaelic is kind of more musical, so there's very little difference between song and, and, and poetry as an art form. <laughs> uh, so are you surprised by how... Poetry in different languages is kind of influenced by very particular things. No, I'm not surprised about that, but I like the the cultural concepts that, that come through because a lot of the things is like that was the, the other thing I wanted to mention about the article that it says something uh, like, you know, when you say, oh, this is a common concept across languages, uh, how many languages are you talking about? Like, is 20 languages representative of? The languages of the world, and well, probably it isn't because there are thousands of languages. Exactly. So uh, that's very interesting. I think it's about uh, putting everything into perspective mm -hmm. how representative the concepts that you use are, and how for other people it can be completely different. And I think it's quite enriching when you read poetry in, in some of these like languages uh, that that use concepts that might, might seem strange to us, but then. You know, they sort of open new, new ways of uh, developing metaphors and just new ways of, of looking at things. Um, obviously, you know the people who are discovering these, they are they are native languages, but it was bit out of them by circumstance or by, by colonialism or whatever. They obviously know more than than we do, for example, about what their language contains, or they know more about what they don't know. But for example, the idea that blue has a different meaning in in Islamic culture in Iran, for example, is interesting, but how different do you think it makes their poetry? Like, I don't know what Iranian poetry is like, yeah. um, or its wider kind of culture in terms of, of color and, and metaphor and symbols, but you think it, it makes a substantial difference to how they see poetry and how they, they write poetry? Because, like, I've, we've looked at Arabic poetry before, uh, we've, yeah. uh, we've looked at Chinese, uh, like, a, like Japanese haikus and stuff like that, and Okay, maybe the form is different, but again, it's kind of saying, it's kind of like appealing to a common human oh, condition, yeah, you know? definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, I find it like more, more enriching, just the fact that it's different doesn't, doesn't mean it's like, it's just kind of like different ways of expressing the same concepts, and I think that's, that's what's nice about it. Yeah. That what you're saying is like a common human thing. Um, but then, you know, they just give us new perspectives on how to express those things. Well, um, no, I think it's very true, but also as well, um, uh, for example, uh, there's, I think there are, I can't, I think it's in Canada, there's Native Americans who are protesting, I think it's an oil, uh, rig or uh, some environmentally destructive con construction. And uh, they don't they don't call it protest. They, they see it as preservation. And I don't know if it's because they've keyed into a concept that that's based on just another way of looking at it, which can happen with different groups of different people that see something thinking outside the box. Or is it maybe a direct trend? Uh, it comes directly from how they articulate it linguistically. You know, I mean, these kind of acts uh, has was that informed by how they articulate these this specific situation where. Why would we protest something that we love? You would never protest. For them, it makes sense that they don't protest things that they care about. For them, it's it's, it's a way of uh, of preserving something that they love, and and because maybe of their language or because it's a tribal structure, I don't know. They have a deeper maybe connection to to the previous generations, and they see their work as continuing on. You know, their job is to continue on what the previous generations um, kept safe. You know, so I don't know. I mean, these are all questions I don't know the answer to. But is it because they're doing the, like for us we protest signs marching whistles anger clenched fists you know but because of their different tack is that because of their historical awareness or because of linguistically they they articulate and frame things differently i don't know uh i don't know yeah, it's yeah. a very big question I yeah mean, i think 
the important thing is like to keep the question going and, and to look at it from the many perspectives that that these languages can can offer and I think that's the reason why projects like this are so important. To find those answers, no? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the last thing we'll say is that they mentioned it's a, it, there's a PhD students of around 25 with a digital camera, digital audio recorder and solar panels uh, who are going off these these faraway countries to uh, discover um, this stuff. And it's interesting as well because I, mean, I remember watching um, and reading about people who, who capture old Irish stories and songs on that kind of like audio recorders or whatever, you know, and uh, even reading a story about a guy who went to this part of Africa, again, cannot remember the specific details, but uh, there was a guy who spoke a language and he was the only person who could speak it because everybody else had died out and the people around him were speaking maybe another variant or another version and uh, he said, okay, I'll come back a week later, a month later, maybe a year later because I can't do it now, but I'm definitely coming back and when he came back, the guy had died. Uh, a week before his his uh, his arrival, so so I mean, not only was it a, a loss, which you know significantly is a personal loss yeah. of, of a person, but um, also you know a, a complete different language mm. uh, or a complete language that's that's been lost to the to the editor. Um, but yeah, it, recording is amazing. I mean, that's a whole point. Podcasts exist as well because they can record the human voice, and they're very very much invented with a noble vision in mind. Uh, Ray Mears, if you ever follow his show, he um, he re- he he played recordings of of uh, to a tribe of of their ancestors from like a hundred years ago, mm. and they could still recognize the sounds and the mm-hmm. and the words and everything. So, uh, the human voice is pretty pretty powerful. That's a Larry <laughs> David reference. Anyway, so uh, anything before we finish, uh, part two? No, I think uh, well check the check out the project and try to. Report in different languages. And thanks to the BBC for sponsoring this podcast. Yes. <laughs>